Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Peace is often a word associated with Christianity, especially at Christmas. You'll see peace on earth, maybe featuring on Christmas cards. But what does what does this actually mean? Um, what is a peacemaker? What does it mean for us as Christians to be a peacemaker? How do we become peacemakers? Do I have to be a peacemaker before I become a Christian? Lots to think about, and these are some of the questions we're going to look at this morning. Um, I've got a five-year-old, a two-and-a-half-year-old, and a, a four-week-year-old downstairs, as well as a bit of construction noise outside. So I'm not sure how peaceful it's going to be, ironically, but we'll see how it goes. My name is John Dunlop. I'm one of the elders at the Living Room Church. Um, warm welcome, and a special warm welcome if you've recently started watching our services online. This is a part of the service where we study the Bible in a bit more detail. We study different books of the Bible. And at the, um, today, um, our, our study comes from the book of Matthew. Matthew was one of Jesus' disciples, and he wrote an account of Jesus' life. Um, and this verse is part of um, one of Jesus' most famous sermons called the Sermon on the Mount. And as part of that sermon, there are 10 Beatitudes or blessings. And blessed is the peacemakers, which we're looking at today, is Beatitude number seven, and it comes in Matthew chapter five, verse nine. So when I was given this topic of um, peacemakers, I tried to think of famous peacemakers. Um, I wonder who immediately comes to mind for you. Um, I also tried to think of people who I know personally, who I know in my, in my personal life, who I would describe as, as a peacemaker. And um, you can quickly have a go at yourself. You don't, you've not got, have it as much time as me, but I don't know about you, but I actually found it quite difficult. Uh, it's not a characteristic you associate with people ordinarily. Um, it's not something you would put on your CV. We like to focus on achievement, winning, victory. These are the, and in some ways, these things are the antithesis of being a peacemaker. And like the other Beatitudes that we've looked at, it is countercultural counter and not very sought after. There are some great examples of, of people who, who can be described as peacemakers from the Bible. You can think of, um, you've got, of course, you've got Jesus, but you've got Joseph from the Old Testament, Jonathan. Um, and if you look at people from recent history, um, you might think of Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King Jr., Mother Teresa, maybe President Gorbachev, um, or maybe some people linked with the, with the Northern Ireland Peace Prize. Um, I looked at some Nobel Peace Prize winners and I was slightly embarrassed that I only recognised a few names. Um, so not only is it quite difficult, but even if you are given this huge honour, um, you're not necessarily going to be that well known. In some years, they don't even give out the award. Um, and there are some, who winners, some winners who reputation subsequently after winning the award, they get the reputations are seriously tarnished. So I'm going to suggest there are not many peacemakers, it's hard, uh, there's not much recognition, and even the best peacemakers fail. So on that cheery note, let us look at what a peacemaker is. So on what is a peacemaker? Peace means reconciliation. So a peacemaker is someone who seeks reconciliation. I mentioned Nelson Mandela. He lived in apartheid era, South Africa, where white people were given enormous privileges and black people were treated horribly. It was a truly awful uh, regime. And Nelson Mandela was in prison for 27 years. But upon his release, he sought to lead efforts to end apartheid, not through force, but he did it through encouraging reconciliation and forgiveness. And it was quite a story. I've been fortunate enough to visit Robben Island where he um, spent time in prison and learned the story. It's fascinating. Um, but while this is a great example, it is not the best example of reconciliation. Far, far from it. God is the author of reconciliation. And actually the whole story of the Bible leads to the greatest reconciliation story there is. The reconciliation brought about by Jesus' death on a cross. The blood of Christ brings about peace. Both before and after Jesus' death, the human race is, is inclined to rebel and has been inclined to rebel against God. There's an animosity there. 
um, between us and God in so many ways. And this leads to a broken relationship. And only through Jesus' death on a cross can we have peace with God. We're no longer his enemies. And this is the peace that Jesus came to establish. And we see that clearly in the Bible. I'm going to read some passages that show this. Colossians and verses. Colossians 1 verse 20. And through him to reconcile him to himself all things, whether on earth, heaven, sorry, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. 2 Corinthians 5, 19 to 21. And he died for all, and that those who might live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And then from Ephesians chapter 2, starting at 14. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in the ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, therefore killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. Those are great, great verses. And we see in that final um, passage that I read, they see the wall of hostility that existed before has been broken. And he preached peace. And that is the gospel. So I'm suggesting that the Bible is clear, that when we speak about peace, the greatest peace we can enjoy is our relationship with God being made good. We often think of pieces relating to hostility as maybe between nations or, or groups being resolved um, or, and we want wars to cease. Uh, and, and that is something we should all desire and we should all want and be praying for. And it, um, it's, but it's the peace that Jesus came to restore between man and woman that is the, the greatest peace. This is the peace he came to establish, the ultimate peace. So I'm going to give you takeaway point number one is that the ultimate peacemaker is Jesus and the ultimate peace is the peace of a restored relationship with God which can only happen as a result of what Jesus did on the cross for us. So then there's the blessing after um, at the end of the, of the verse it says for they shall be called sons of God. We'll look at what it means for us personally to be peacemakers, but I want to look at, at this blessing in a little bit more detail. What does it mean to be a son of God and why is it such a good thing? We can also describe sons of God as being children of God. You see in John chapter 12, it says, To all who received him, that's Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So by definition, being a child of God means we are part of God's family. And I don't think we realise how much of a privilege that is um, and what it really means for us. It should give us so much assurance. God will not let us go. He loves us. He cares for us. He is a perfect father. And the implications of being part of God's family are vast. We can only touch on them today. Um, I'm going to go to Romans 8 verses 14 to 17. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but have received the spirit of adoption or the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So there's just some points to take out of that. We are not to fear, verse 15. It's not, a, don't have a slave master, but a loving father. That love is secure. And there's not a fear of being banished, like if you're an employee or a servant. 
There's intimacy we see also in verse 15, because it's by him we cry, Abba. Abba best is best translated, I think, as daddy, a term of great intimacy. A child wouldn't usually use a more formal term like father, and likely to have a, a, a more endearing term that's kind of got famili trusting familiar familiarity, um, such as dad. And this is how Christians um, can approach the all-powerful creator. We have, number three, we have assurance. In verse 16 there, it says, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. When we cry out to God as Abba, the spirit of God somehow comes alongside us and gives us an assurance that we are truly in God's family. The very concept of adoption gives security. Number four, we have an inheritance. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. This means we have an incredible future. All Christians are heirs of God. Traditionally, especially in the culture of the time, the eldest male would have received the inheritance. But we are all sons of God. We all have a great, as Christians, we all have a great inheritance as um, both male and female, oldest, the youngest. It's a great truth. And then five, we have a family likeness as we are children of God. As we are adopted, God actually implants Christ's nature in us. As sons of God, we actually come to resemble the Son of God. As we bear the family likeness of suffering, we come more and more like Jesus and our Father in our character and attitudes. So being a son of God is the ultimate reward. So takeaway number two, for those who have accepted and believed in the name of Jesus, we are children of God. That means we are loved, cherished and cared for by God. So we've looked at what peace is and that Jesus is the ultimate peacemaker. We've considered what it is to be a son or child of God. And now we're going to consider what it means for us to live as peacemakers as we live our lives. But first thing, I'm going to speak a little bit about what it doesn't tell us. What this verse is not saying is that if you are a great peacemaker, you'll become a son of God. Or put another way, you can't become a Christian simply by working really hard and making sure everyone gets along and that people don't fall out with anyone and that you don't fall out with anyone. That is not the message of Christianity. And also, if you've been a bad peacemaker in your life, which most of us have at some point, in fact, all of us have, that does not exclude us from being part of God's family in the future. Again, that's not the message of Christianity. In fact, it doesn't matter what commandment we are speaking about, you can earn your salvation. We use the phrase a lot, by faith alone. What that means is that you can only become part of God's family that we've spoken about through faith in Jesus Christ. That is very different what many people's perceptions are or understanding of Christianity is. And it's a very important point to understand. This verse is, and this verse is not cutting across that concept of faith alone. It may look like it from first reading. It might look like um, Blessed are the peacemakers, so you must become a peacemaker and then you'll become a children of God, child of God. But that's not what it means. It's primarily, primarily a verse for those who are already part of God's family, for those who have already come to know Christ as their saviour. And actually, it's the same for all the Beatitudes that we've studied. So takeaway number three, you can't earn your salvation by being a good peacemaker. And it's not a prerequisite. To become a Christian. So what does it mean for Christians? As we are in Christ, we are by definition peacemakers. As Christians, this is now who we are. We may not be as good as we'd like at being a peacemaker, but this is who we are. We are made righteous in God's eyes. And Andrew spoke about a, a little bit about um, this the last time he spoke. And that gives us comfort. It's important to bear that in mind as we look at what it means from a, from a practical perspective. We are part of God's family. We share the family likeness. We are peacemakers. But let's look at it 
from a, a more practical point. The Beatitudes explain our position in Christ. So as I've said, we are peacemakers, but they are also statements that drive us to action. Every Christian is expected to share in the work of peacemaking in our communities and in our church. And it is a command for us. I'm going to read some verse, a couple of verses again. Romans 12, verse 18. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 11. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Clear from Jesus' teaching and the Bible as a whole, that we are not to seek conflict or be responsible for it. Rather, we are to actively pursue peace. And as it says in that verse from Romans, live peaceably with all. But I think that living peaceably with all does not go as far as the call to be peacemakers, because I think being a peacemaker requires positive action, not simply about avoiding confrontation and being nice. It's being a peacemaker is not passive. I'm quite good at being passive and looking like a, a nice guy and especially at work and I might, but do I actively seek to resolve conflict? And I think that in hostility and I think that's that can be tricky. So let's look at some examples of what it means to be a peacemaker. Number one, evangelism. I'm going to suggest that the greatest act of peacemaking that we can do is to work to bring people to Jesus. The reason I say that is if the greatest peace we can have is to have peace with Jesus, to have your sins forgiven, then to assist with bringing somebody to that relationship is the natural outworking of receiving that peace ourselves in our lives. Hope that makes sense. To bring a sinner to Christ where they are made right with God, I think is our primary peacemaking role. Uh, role. And to proclaim the good news of the gospel is called evangelism. It's paramount and it's a command, not just from this verse, Mark 16, verse 15, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation not just for those who are gifted in it. I find this challenging. I struggle to share my faith with others. I struggle to bring it up in conversation and I struggle to take opportunities once the conversation does move to, to faith or even to, to religion or morals. I prefer it if peace making, as I said into that before, just meant being nice to people. And I know many of us would, would share in that struggle. Yeah, I know I'm not alone. I know many of us, um, uh, yeah, but I know many of us actually are great evangelists. Um, you share, you pray, you send links to people, um, you listen, you proclaim. And it's great to hear stories of what others do. Let's keep, keep going with that. There'll be different reasons for us to, to not do it as well as we should. We might not want to be rejected. We don't want to be ridiculed. We might lack in faith. But as I've prepared for this talk, I'm challenged that Jesus was willing to make peace with me and take me into his family, despite all my weakness. And as a result, I receive an inheritance that is beyond my understanding. And that really should propel me into action. I pray that it will, and I pray that it will for people listening just now and for our church. The second way we can be peacemakers is within the church. Unity in church is that we all have in church, something we all have to strive for. It's everyone's responsibility. And there's something beautiful about unity, especially amongst diversity. Um, Ephesians 4, 1 to 3 says, Therefore, a prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united 
in the same mind and the same judgment. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 11. Finally, brothers, rejoice, aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Unity in the church is hard. It's not, it's not easy. It was an issue in the early church. That's why Paul mentions it in his letters. Um, it's been a problem throughout history. And you can read about it in church history. And unfortunately, some of you or many of you will have experienced it in, in your churches before. We have been blessed at the living and that there have been no major arguments or not that I know about that have threatened a split or caused a major issue. Especially, I think, given the variety of, of backgrounds and theological backgrounds that we have. But we can't take that for granted. We've got to continue to work at it. Sinclair Ferguson said it is a very serious issue to disrupt church peace. And it is not just not causing disunity, but can you honestly say that you have faithfully sought the peace of Christ's church? And that is our challenge. In our church, there are differences in opinions on lots of different things, on theological aspects, and there may, there, there may, there may be tensions um, there. We have differences in political opinion. There have been tensions and still will be there. Same, you could say the same thing about maybe our church building, differences of opinion, what we should do. Um, or the coronavirus, um, lots of different views about the vaccine, about the government's restrictions, lots of different opinions. There'll be tensions about things like music and church and worship style. I have my opinions like all of you on all these things. Um, of course, I think I'm right <laughs> about them all. We can't let these things um, cause disunity amongst us. We should be united about the gospel, our love for the gospel, our love for Christ, our desire to see the message being proclaimed and that our communities will be transformed as a result. Let this be our unifying factor. Let us be patient with one another, respectful of other opinions and views. More than just being respectful, though, we must go further than that. We must love each other in spite of our differences. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's not just a tolerance of each other, it's about loving each other. A quick point that I have to make though before before we move on. Um, it, a unity can, can't be at the expense of truth or doctrine, I'm not saying that. Um, it's not cheap peace, as John Stott once called it. There'll be things that we do have to make a stand on because they are biblical and true. Um, so if you try and be friends with everyone at the expense of standing up for truth, then, then you're not honouring God at that point. Um, so Jesus prayed for oneness of his people, but also for truth and to be kept from evil. So we need to get that balance, not necessarily easy, but we pray for wisdom in doing so. We also have to be peacemakers out with the church. We should strive to be shining lights in our community. Stepping out to be peacemakers is countercultural. We avoid conflict, we run away. That's a, na a natural instinct. And I said at the start of this talk that not many strive to be peacemakers and not many people are known for it. But what a difference if we were known for being peacemakers. It might not be the obvious calling for us, but it was important enough for Jesus to mention it as a seventh beatitude. He could have mentioned lots of different things or characteristics, but he mentioned this one. So we should take it seriously in the situations that we find ourselves in. So fourth and, and the final thing that I'm going to say that we can do is pray. Um, I listened to a podcast recently and the host said that one thing he hears a lot is, I'll be praying, but I wish there was more that I could do. And I think we all understand the sentiment of that statement and we know what they're trying to say. But what this statement also does is, is reduce the importance of prayer. Um, when it comes to the salvation of others and bringing about peace in that in our relationship with them and God, prayer is powerful. And it's powerful for more um, present matters in, the, in, the, in this day and age for war and hostility in the world. So let's continue to pray um, for world events, world situations, things that we see around us in our society. So takeaway four, there's lots in this, 
being a peacemaker won't earn your salvation, as we've said. So here it is. But as we are Christians, we are called to be peacemakers. Our primary way of being, peace, of being a peacemaker is to tell people the good news of the gospel. And it also requires us to seek unity inside and outside of the church. So final thought, being a peacemaker isn't easy. It's necessary, but it's not easy. And the great thing is, is that Christians, we have the Holy Spirit to help us. And we need to ask for the Spirit's help. I'm just going to go through our takeaway points. Just read them again as a reminder. So the, number one, the ultimate peacemaker is Jesus. And the ultimate peace is the peace of restored relationship with God, which can only happen as a result of what Jesus did on the cross for us. Takeaway two, for those who have accepted and believe and for, for those who have accepted and believed in the name of Jesus, we are children of God. That means we are loved, cherished and cared for by God. Takeaway number three, you can't earn your salvation by being a good peacemaker. And it's not a prerequisite to becoming a Christian. We as Christians are called to be, this is number four, we as Christians are called to be peacemakers. Our primary way of being a peacemaker is to tell people the good news of the gospel. It also requires us to seek unity inside and outside of the church. Wow, I've not spoken for a while. Um, I've learned so much about what it means to be a peacemaker. I hope you have too, or at least a little bit. It's not easy. Um, there will be opposition and it comes at a price. But the ultimate peacemaking act came at a huge price. Jesus' death on a cross, which meant our relationship with God can be transformed from hostility to peace. And the reward of being a peacemaker is worth it being a child of God. Let us pray. Lord God, help us to be peacemakers. Thank you that you are the ultimate peacemaker, that you died for us um, so that we can be forgiven and that our relationship with you can be restored. Being a peacemaker isn't easy, but help us to step out of our comfort zones and to take positive steps um, to bringing about peace in the situations that we are in. Amen.